<laughs> okay, uh, welcome to the first session. Um, it, I think mean, that the first session builds up to the, uh, the important uh, talk that won the prize. So as our first warm-up act, <laughs> uh, we have Benjamin here, who's going to talk about Wirecard. Thank you very much. All right, guys, apparently I misplaced my pointer, but there's a one right here for us to use, so that's very useful. Uh, so I'm here to talk about analysis that I did with Kenny Patterson, who is also a Royal Holloway, looking at the WireGuard Key Exchange Protocol. So, let's get started. So, uh, first a little bit of motivation as to why WireGuard exists even in the first place, what it's intending to do, and kind of why I think it's interesting to have a look at and understand in some sort of formal way. So, WireGuard is the output of Jason Donnefeld. Uh, it is a publication in NDSS 2016, and it's essentially intended to be a VPN replacement. So, current VPN uh, technologies include things like IPsec or OpenVPN, and it is incredibly complex. So, I'm not expecting you to read this table here, but essentially they are uh, modes that you can run Ike version 1, which is the underlying key exchange inside IPsec or at least it's one of them. And so I could spend about 10 minutes going through all of these different options, figure out exactly what these security guarantees are and what uh, you're actually expecting out of all of these different modes. But developers don't have the expertise and don't have the training that we do. And so this just looks like a nightmare, essentially. And so that's not to mention things like security associations, public key infrastructure, all of these things. You're just giving developers essentially more rope in which to hang themselves with. And so OpenVPN has a very similar problem. It has a lot of complexity that it inherits from TLS. And so Jason Donnefeld was looking at all of these and said, well, why don't we have a stripped down, streamlined VPN replacement uh, that uses modern cryptography? Uh, and so the uh, WireGuard is his VPN replacement. It's run over UDP. And the idea is to use the NOSE protocol framework, which is a protocol framework that's introduced by Trevor Perrin, one of the designers behind Signal, as the basis for a new streamlined key exchange protocol. And well, it's a protocol framework, which means that there's lots of different protocol variants. So we don't want to implement all of these within WireGuard because you end up with the exact same problem. So we're just going to be focusing on IKPSK2, uh, which you can see uh, right here is pretty straightforward. So this is in the language of the noise protocol specification. It's streamlined, there's a whole bunch of rules, but the point is that you can represent this protocol in essentially four lines. Um, and for another reason as to why I believe that it's incredibly important to look at WireGuard. So obviously I'm not expecting you to read this either, but this is a letter from Rodden Wyden, I believe, is a United States Senator. And it's a letter to the director of NIST. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from this, it's that uh, this sentence within the letter, I urge NIST to work with stakeholders to evaluate appropriate replacements, including WireGuard. And he's talking about replacements for VPN technologies. This was in, published in the last week, so this was a bit of a gimme. But uh, I think that this really motivates us to understand what WireGuard is doing in a formal sense. And so now I'm going to introduce the WireGuard protocol. Um, before I go really deep into the details of its key exchange, which is what I'm going to be uh, looking at um, most specifically, here's a couple, a couple of cool nifty features about it. So it has less than 5,000 lines of code, and it's implemented, I believe, currently in the Linux kernel, um, which makes it super easy to audit. Uh, it's highly performant in its original NDSS uh, publication. Uh, Jason showed that it outperforms both IPsec and OpenVPN. And I've already kind of touched on this before, but its design is nice, it's simple, it's easy to use and it's made up of standard cryptographic primitives. So what does this mean exactly? So WireGuard boasts that it's cryptographically opinionated, which I say is just a nice way of saying that crypto agility kind of sucks. You're just giving more developers more ways in which to shoot themselves in the foot. So it essentially just uses the Dan Bernstein cipher suite. So Blake 2, Cha Cha Poly, if you're gonna be doing elliptic curve Diffie Hellman, which in WireGuard there is a lot of elliptic curve Diffie Hellman, you're only going to be using curve 25519. Now notice that uh, for authentication, I haven't touched on signatures. 
WireGuard doesn't use signatures at all. Instead, it uses long-term Diffie-Hellman uh, key shares to authenticate the parties to each other. So how are these long-term keys established? This is kind of outside the, um, the scope of the WireGuard protocol. In some way before the protocol uh, is initialized, you set up and securely exchange your long-term Diffie-Hellman keys, um, and those are associated with a range of allowable IP addresses. So this isn't captured within our analysis. So there's a lot of details going on in here, but uh, it's actually a pretty simple uh, protocol. So it's a two-message protocol, initiator uh, to responder, responder to initiator. You are essentially sampling ephemeral Diffie-Hellman keys, and you're mixing them with the long-term Diffie-Hellman keys of the initiator and responder. And in order to give you some sort of like post-quantum security, uh, they also include pre-shared keys. The establishment of these pre-shared keys additionally is outside the scope of the WireGuard protocol. So going for a slightly deeper dive now, this is the very first message that's being sent in the WireGuard handshake. And so it allows you to establish uh, secure session keys for uh, establishing a secure channel. So the initiator samples an ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key and then uses that with the long-term uh, Diffie-Hellman key of the responder to establish this K3. Uh, and that is used to encrypt, using an AEAD scheme, the long-term key of the initiator. That gives you some sort of identity privacy. So a passive adversary can't figure out exactly who is trying to communicate with this responder. Additionally, you then sample a timestamp and then encrypt this using K4. So K4 is essentially the long-term key of the responder and the initiator and includes this salt here. This salt is essentially like a Diffie-Hellman chain. So it is a PRF output that includes all previous Diffie-Hellman uh, operations. And you use that to encrypt the timestamp and that gives you some sort of protection against uh, replayability. Um, you essentially add those uh, AAD ciphertexts to these maps, which aren't very cryptographically interesting. Uh, so you can see here, this first map is actually keyed using long-term key of the responder. It's a public value. You're not gaining much out of doing this. Uh, similarly, the I haven't talked about what this cookie is. Uh, WireGuard also has a denial of service protection mechanism. Uh, using cookie replays, and this is sent in clear text essentially, so uh, this isn't doing anything cryptographically interesting either. All of the uh, authentication comes from these AAD ciphertexts. Similarly, the uh, responder computes K3, K4, samples its own ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key, uh, combines it with the ephemeral key of the initiator, as well as the long-term key of the initiator to create this K9 here. I'll go into details about how that's done. It's essentially a PRF chain. Um, and then uh, encrypts essentially a zero uh, length ciphertext with some header value um, and sends that along to the initiator. Afterwards, you're kind of done. You use that chaining value again to derive brand new traffic keys and you establish a secure channel. And so in order for us to look at the WireGuard handshake in a formal way, it means we need to have a security model uh, that formalizes all of the notions that WireGuard is attempting to protect against. Now thankfully, instead of like going back to this handshake and trying to figure out, okay, what exactly am, uh, is WireGuard attempting to do, Jason very helpfully included a list of things that it hopes that WireGuard achieves. Actually, it explicitly says that it does achieve. Uh, so we just had to pass this list uh, and pull out things that are most interesting to me. So it wants to achieve AKE security in a ECK model. Uh, I'll return to ECK in a second. Uh, it also attempts to achieve key compromise impersonation resilience. So the idea that even if you have corrupted my long-term key, you can't impersonate anyone else to me. Uh, perfect forward secrecy, so obviously the idea that if you corrupt the long-term keys of the uh, users after the session is complete, then the session key should still be secure. 
Uh, and we also want a model that uh, includes these PSKs in some sort of formal way. So this is a bit of a mouthful of acronyms. So we want an ECK, KCI, PFS, PSK, AKE model. Well, something like that already kind of exists. So uh, Kremers and Feltz in the Beyond ECK paper captures a lot of these notions. So AKE <coughs> security in the ECK model, key compromise impersonation resilience, perfect forward secrecy. So essentially all we need to do is augment and include PSKs in some way, and then we should have something which to analyze WireGuard with, which would be fantastic. Um, so getting a little bit deeper into what this security model actually looks like. Uh, so you are essentially a challenger playing a game with the adversary. Uh, the adversary uh, is trying to break key distinguishability. So at the end of the game, the adversary will issue a test query to some uh, session that has completed, and the session will return either a real or a random session key from the same distribution. And the adversary has to distinguish which world it's kind of living in. And so you sample this test bit, which tells you whether it's the real or random key. You uh, generate a whole bunch of asymmetric long-term keys. So in WireGuard, these will be the long-term Diffie-Hellman keys and you distribute those to all of the parties that you're going to be implementing. Um, and the adversary obviously has access to all of these. Uh, then you uh, essentially maintain a whole bunch of registers. So you've got a PSK register, EPK register, and that is a time code that should be ASK. And they represent whether the adversary has uh, leaked or corrupted the pre-shared keys, the ephemeral randomness, which is what ECK essentially captures, is uh, the ability of the adversary to leak the uh, ephemeral randomness that is sampled within the protocol execution, or the asymmetric, which it should be, uh, keys uh, that are computed at the start of the experiment. Then the adversary uh, has the ability to play this game, having access to these particular oracles, so the send query allows the adversary to be in uh, full command of the uh, network. Allows them to drop, delete, modify, inject, or delay messages at will. Uh, the create essentially allows the adversary to go, okay, I want Alice to talk to Bob in this particular uh, protocol execution. So it allows them to manage what, uh, pro sorry, manage which sessions are talking to each other. Uh, create PSK allows the adversary to establish honestly shared um, pre-shared keys uh, between uh, any two parties. Uh, notice that this doesn't allow for the adversary to establish uh, malicious keys. This only allows you to establish honest keys that are sampled randomly from the pre-shared key space. Um, but we do allow the adversary to obviously corrupt these uh, pre-shared keys using this particular query. Uh, in addition, the adversary is allowed to leak the long-term keys of any given party. It's allowed to reveal the, uh, the session keys that are the output of any protocol execution. And it's also allowed to uh, leak the ephemeral randomness sampled within any protocol execution. At some point, the adversary will issue a test query, which will return them either a real or a random session key based on this guess bit here. Uh, and then the adversary will output its guess at what this bit is. If the session that it has previously tested is clean, according to some pre uh, cleanest predicate, you evaluate whether this is true, and you return whether the adversary wins the game. Otherwise, you randomly sample a bit and return that instead. So obviously, if uh, we only allow the adversary to win if it's clean, we need to establish in some formal way what cleanness is. So cleanness allows the out allows us to essentially throw out any particular game that the adversary has trivially won. Uh, so they have to uh, any test session uh, has to adhere to these particular conditions uh, in order for it to be a clean session and not be trivially broken. First one's pretty straightforward. You're not allowed to reveal the same session key that you're trying to do the real or random game with. Obviously, if you could, you just compare that with the output that you got from the test uh, query, and uh, you're easily, trivially breaking the, the game. 
the second condition essentially captures the idea that you're not allowed to fully reveal any session state within a protocol execution. So uh, you're not allowed to reveal all of the pre-shared key, the ephemeral key, and the long-term key of the test session. Obviously, that would allow you to completely recompute any operations that the session does within its protocol execution, trivially uh, compute the session key that's the output, and then compare that with the uh, real or random session key. Uh, similarly, the third condition is uh, the exact same thing, but for any honest partner. Obviously, there's two parties in this protocol execution. The other party, if it's been computed honestly, will compute the same session key. Uh, so you don't want the adversary to be able to do the exact same thing, but for its matching session. Uh, and finally, uh, this is to capture perfect forward secrecy notions. Um, if there doesn't exist someone that uh, the test session has been communicating with in some honest way, then the adversary may not have um, corrupted the, the long-term key of the intended partner before the test session is up. And so, each of these kind of corresponds to one of these conditions here. So, uh, key compromise impersonation is captured by the fact that you're allowed to reveal the long-term key of the test session at any point. There's no restriction on that. Perfect forward secrecy is, as I said, captured in this fourth condition here. Um, inclusion of the PSKs is included within two and three. Uh, and what was the last one? Oh, authenticated key exchange. Uh, is captured by uh, the experiment as a whole. <coughs> and so when we try to use this model to model, uh, to actually assess the security of WireGuard, uh, we found a little bit of a problem. And this problem has been noted before. So this is kind of an extension on the point that Hugo Korczak made in the, I believe, HMQV paper, which is to say that no true message protocol can actually uh, achieve um, KCI resilience in a perfect forward secrecy setting without the use of signatures, essentially. So the idea is, is that in the very, if I go back a little bit, in this very first message here from the initiator to the responder, the only secret that you, um, the adversary needs to recompute all of this is essentially the long-term key of the responder. K3 is uh, computed using the ephemeral key and the long-term key of the responder. K4 using the long-term key of the initiator and the long-term key of the responder. Uh, so if you uh, essentially reveal the long-term key of the responder, you can impersonate anyone uh, to the responder. And then after you're done, you do your test, uh, test query. You've got a real or uh, session key. And because you're in the perfect forward secrecy model, you're allowed to corrupt the long-term key of the initiator at this point, recompute the session keys that the uh, responder has computed, and try and win this key indistinguishability game. Now, WireGuard actually addresses this. Uh, and it says that the responder should wait for the first encrypted message from the initiator to the responder before it starts sending data. But that's problematic in uh, trying to analyze this as an AKE security model. The first encrypted message will allow a trivial distinguishing attack. You try and decrypt the first message using your real or random key. If it decrypts successfully, well then it's the real key. If it doesn't, then it's a random key. So either we can uh, try and improve a slightly weakened notion, so uh, WireGuard should be secure in weak perfect forward secrecy instead, where you don't allow the initiator to Sorry, you don't allow the adversary to impersonate an initiator. Or you can use an ACCE model instead of an AKE model. So instead of key indistinguishability, you're trying to go for security of the uh, underlying channel. Or you can try and modify WireGuard to achieve these explicit strong security notions. And that's what we do. So we modify WireGuard by adding a key confirmation message, essentially. And this kind of models what WireGuard is doing in the real world. But it's not sending any um, encrypted messages, it, like the zero ciphertext that's being sent from the responder. Um, it uh, contains only a header value. Um, and it is computed using all possible combinations of these elliptic curve um, Diffie-Hellman keys. 
Um, you're not uh, adding an additional round trip, so the modification is quite minimal, and the keys that you're using to compute this AEAD ciphertext are actually independent of the traffic keys, so that you don't have this trivial distinguishing attack. Uh, Jason, on the other hand, we talked to Jason about this at Real World Crypto this year, um, and his response is essentially that this is a feature, not a bug. And the reasoning is that WireGuard is run over UDP, which means you can't actually trust that these handshake messages are delivered reliably. So you want to minimize the amount of uh, cryptographic like, necessary messages within the handshake. So the difference between what our solution is and what WireGuard does is that WireGuard's any message from the initiator to the responder essentially works to fix this problem. Whereas ours, you need this particular message, unfortunately. So, uh, breezing through this now, uh, we do an analysis of our modified uh, WireGuard protocol. Um, there are a lot of cases, you break it up into three cases, and then the third case is broken up into five different sub-cases. It's not that uh, interesting. Uh, if you want to know more details, obviously, go to our paper. Um, it's based on a PRF ODH assumption, as well as PRF assumptions. And for the first two cases, which are essentially authentication uh, cases, we require AEAD. Uh, so here's a list of things that we kind of ignore and some problems with our analysis. It's not particularly tight. It'd be nicer if we could get a, a slightly tighter reduction. Uh, we don't model the identity hiding of the initiator to the responder, which would be interesting to catch. Um, and finally, there are cooking mechanisms that we talked about before, and key rotation mechanisms, and uh, our analysis doesn't touch that. Uh, so thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Comments? No? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Okay, so our second speaker before the main event of the morning is um, going to be Benny Pinkers, and he's talking about virtual threshold security. Hi, thank you. So uh, this is a talk with uh, Yutama Hall and Itai Bram from uh, VMware Research, and it was done by the uh, VMware Research Group. And it's more about the uh, network security part of this conference, like ACNS, I guess that NS is for network security. Uh, it's about uh, distributed SSH key management with proactive uh, SA uh, security and I'll describe this. So, uh, with cryptography we have secret keys and secret keys are vulnerable to, uh, to being uh, uh, stolen. So, these are a bunch of news about secret keys being stolen. Down here it's interesting, so Snowden likely used SSH keys to access classified NSA data. So it's, this happened at the NSA. And the question is, where should we store keys? And the answer is that it's very hard. Like, I guess if any one of you has uh, any cryptocurrency and your key really is worth money, then the question is, where am I going to store this, I don't know, key which is worth millions of dollars in the, in the uh, good scenario? Uh, and uh, here, all of these cases are about uh, SSH keys being leaked. So let's talk more about SSH. So SSH goes for the secure, uh, secure shell. So we usually know it as a protocol for connecting a terminal to a remote host, but actually it's being used for a lot of connections in, in enterprise networks. So connect, I mean, uh, moving files, uh, one machine connects to the other. Uh, so in a typical enterprise network, there are a lot, thousands, millions of SSS, SSH connections. Uh, which are using uh, this protocol. And the question that we want to answer or want to solve is how to authenticate uh, clients. Usually clients are authenticated either, either using uh, passwords or public key crypto, and they need keys and they want to secure it better. So SSH, uh, it's a protocol between a client and a server. 
The client has a private public keeper and the server should know the public key of the client. And then after they do a, a session handshake, the client uh, signs the session ID with its key, sends to the uh, server, and the server verifies the signature. And this is supposed to protect against a man in the middle attack. And the question is, how is the client going to store this secret key? And the most common method that SSH uses is RSA, which is a bit troublesome for uh, threshold security. So currently, SSH is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol run, like I guess the envision between a user and a, with a terminal and a server, so the user should hold its keys. The problem is that in an enterprise network, you have you know, hundreds of thousands of machines. Each one of them might be a client, and it needs to store its key. So if the keys are stored on each machine, this is a huge mess, and it makes it easy to steal these keys. And this is what all of these attacks made. And usually the administrators don't know where the keys are, and even worse than that, they don't know who connects to whom. So if you know, one machine connects to the other, I mean, the machines know, know that, but the administrators don't have a way of knowing who connects to whom. And if an attacker breaks into a machine, it makes things even worse, because if the attacker is doing bad things and using SSH to secure that, then whoever observes the network doesn't know, you know what the attacker is doing. So you would like to get some kind of you know, intelligence about what's happening in the network, to identify uh, uh, suspicious activities, but it's hard to do that. So we would like to have a centralized key management, and in that case, you know, there's one center that can observe all connections, uh, approve them, and also log all activities and look for uh, bad behavior, and then can enforce all kinds of policies, and this seems like a good thing for an enterprise. But currently, it's not supported by SSA, which is peer-to-peer, and, okay, this central case solution is also good because clients don't need to store their keys. Uh, so it's a good thing, but on the other hand, it's uh, a one point of failure, both in terms of security, if someone breaks into this central service, and in terms of availability, because if this central service falls, then no one can connect to it. So we design here what we call the ESKM for Enterprise SSH Key Management, which is a secure and fault tolerant key management based out of care out of N threshold RSA signatures with proactive security. And here's the main difficulty in terms of our cryptographic solutions. And it supports on the fly addition of servers and password based user authentication, which is secure against offline attacks. And it has minimum modifications. Uh, it supports what we call algorithmic virtualization. We change the client, but the servers don't know that they talk with our you know, system. For them, it's just a simple client. And that's very good in terms of you know, making, uh, uh, you know, enabling deployment of this system without changing everything. So I'll talk about the cryptography. So uh, in SSH, the client and server uses Diffie Hellman to agree on a key and to prevent the man in the middle attack. They either use password, but or they use public key authentication, which is mostly the case. Uh, and we uh, look at uh, uh, securing a private key for this authentication. This authentication is done using the RSA. Uh, and we're going to use secret sharing. So I guess most of you know secret sharing. So Shamir, we have a secret. You use design. A polynomial, so if you want a threshold to be 3, you design a polynomial of degree 2, and you give each server a value of this polynomial, and give it any three values of this polynomial, you can interpolate it and find the value of the polynomial at 0, which is the secret. And we work with our say. So with our say, you have a you know, public key N and E, and the private key is D, and also phi of N. Right, the number of elements in the group, of multiplicative, multiplicative, multiplicative group module N. And knowledge of phi of N is as bad as knowing the private key, so we'd like to hide it. And the signature is done by raising the hash of the message to the power of D, so I guess everyone knows that. 
And if you do arithmetic in the exponent, it is modulo phi of n. And that's going to be the main problem that we're going to face. So we'd like to do threshold security. So to do n out of n uh, threshold RSA signatures is easy. So we'd like to share the key between n servers, and we need n of them to sign. So in this case, each server has a value, and d, the secret key, is the sum of these values over the integers. Okay? And then, uh, the servers have these values, and the client uh, wants to sign a message, sends a request, gets from each server the hash of the message, raises to the share known by the server, multiplies them, and gets the signature. So here the client needs to contact all n servers to get the signature, but n out of n uh, you know, threshold is not good for availability, so we'd like to do a k out of n. So with k out of n, it's a bit more troublesome. So what people usually do is they set a polynomial uh, to be able to be k minus 1, so that it's 0 equals to the secret, uh, and S in this case for our say should be defined modulo phi of n. And server J receives S to the power of J. And K values of S enable interpolation. And S0 is the secret key. Okay, and S0, if you get K values of the polynomial, S0 is some inner combination of them multiplied by corresponding Lagrange coefficients. So to do the signature, so the client receives from each server the uh, message raised to the power of the share of this server, and if it gets k of these, it needs to interpolate in the exponent. So we know that S0 is the sum of the shares multiplied by some Lagrange coefficients. So in the exponent, you have to take uh, basically each of the values you received, raised to the power of the Lagrange coefficient, multiply, and you get the signature. So that's great, and these are the Lagrange coefficients, basically a multiplication of some server IDs divided by multiplication of some other server IDs. But here's the problem. So this should be computed in the exponent, so this computation is modulo phi of n. So therefore you need to divide by something modulo phi of n, but phi of n needs to be secret. And if you know the inverse items, this is equivalent to breaking the system. So it's hard to do this, I mean, it's hard to compute the Lagrange coefficients. So Shub came up with a nice solution. And the solution was, like, basically, I'm simplifying here, but let's multiply everything by delta, which is n squared. So n is the number of servers, and we multiply everything by uh, n factorial. Delta is n factorial. So in this case, uh, the modified Lagrange coefficient uh, uh, lambda pad is the original one multiplied by delta. So here we had all these things that we had problem dividing with. If you multiply everything by n squared, then these all cancel out. And we get basically just a multiplication of integers, which is easy, even modulo phi of n, just do it over the integers. So this is great. And, uh, and when you use this to for interpolation, so instead of uh, multiplying by you know, getting the right of results. You get the result multiplied by uh, n factorial, n is the number of servers, say 16, and from this you can get the signature using some tricks. Okay? And I'm completely lying here, this is not what he's doing, but that's, that's the major idea. The major idea is to multiply everything by n factorial and get rid of the, uh, of the division. So we implement this, implemented this for our system and got threshold security. And also you can implement here share verification, should describe this, and previously Shaw and Peterson, and we also implemented this, and this is supported in our system. But the problem is with uh, proactive security. <coughs> so with proactive security, <coughs> I can refer to, I guess, <coughs> sorry, Herzberg, Jarecki, Kravchik, and Jung as maybe the first one to describe it. And the idea is to force any adversary who wants to break into the system to break into K servers at, in a very short time span. So what we do, <coughs> we distribute the keys and we also, also continually refresh them. So every short period of time, it might be an hour, a minute, you know, a few seconds, you refresh all keys and the adversary must break into 
case servers at the same time frame to get keys that enable it to get the uh, secret, uh, secret key. And if it breaks into even all servers, but not in a short time frame, it's not going to happen. So the idea is about this. So you have like, this Shamir secret sharing, and this is the secret, and service has values of this polynomial. So every short time they uh, agree on a polynomial, which is uh, 0 at 0, and then each server adds uh, its share to the value of this polynomial. So essentially now they agree on a new polynomial, and the value of this polynomial at 0 is equal to the value of the original one, which is uh, the secret, but all of our other values are different. So if the adversary goes to one party here and gets this share, and then to another server here and got that share, these two shares don't uh, help the adversary to get the, the secret. This is a very nice idea, and it's been used extensively for uh, securing keys. And the idea is the following. So uh, every, the end of each time epoch, as they call it, each party generates a random polynomial, uh, which is zero and zero. And then it sends values of this polynomial to each other party. So everyone is sending shares to everyone, and then each party receives many shares, so it adds them. So basically what it computes is a value of a, uh, a new polynomial, which is equal to that of the original polynomial, plus the sum of many other polynomials at the same location i. This is done by server i. And so basically it computes a share of this new polynomial s tag, and in this s tag at zero is equal to the uh, original polynomial of, of, at zero because all of these new polynomials are zero at zero. So basically, you get shares of a new uh, of a new polynomial which is zero at zero, which which is has the same secret at zero. And from now on, you're going to work with this new polynomial. So this is the idea of proactive security and has been used extensively. Okay, and you can also do verification to make sure that you get good shares from other parties. But the problem is with RSA. This has been used a lot for uh, 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 securing uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman-based signatures, but not for RSA. In RSA, the problem is that these polynomials must be defined on the Rufi of N. And if I go back, then each party should like, define a polynomial on the Rufi of N, but the party should not know phi of n because knowledge of phi of n is equal to learning the secret key. So that's a problem with RSA. And there were previous solutions by Tal Weyman and others, but what they do, they uh, essentially require all servers to participate in each signature, and if a server doesn't participate, then the others have shares of the key of that server, and they kind of open everything. Okay? So this is good, like in, in in theory, but it requires each party who wants the signature to contact all servers and get answers from all of them, and this is not going to scale well in a large system. Okay? So it's not a tr it's the threshold here only works uh, if uh, 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 like all of them are online, and if one guy doesn't want to help, then they kind of reveal everything about this guy, and we have one less last one less server. Uh, so it works if everyone is available and some guys are sometimes bad. It doesn't work if some servers are not online all the time. So what we do instead is that we define the polynomials not modulo phi of n, but over the integers. So basically we do secret sharing over the integers, but the uh, coefficients of the polynomial are chosen as integers between 0 and r, and r is about as large as the public key. So secret sharing over the integers is, not, is known to be insecure. It's not unconditionally secure. For instance, if you know that p of 1 has a certain value and all coefficients are, are, are positive, then you know that the secret p of 0 is smaller than that value. So this takes information. Okay? But the nice thing is that since the coefficients are random, uh, usually we're not going to leak too much information and it might, might be good enough for us. So what happens if we leak a few bits about the key? So if we leak, leak sigma bits about the key, this might speed up the attack by a factor of 2 to the sigma. And I'll show you why it's like, if you have an attack that uses this sigma bits uh, and breaks 
the, uh, okay, we did Sigma beats, we have an attack that uses these beats to break the key, then you can have an attack which then does not use these beats and runs in times which is large by most effect of 2 to the Sigma. And the thing is, if you get Sigma beats and you are able to break the RSA in time T, the adversary does not have these Sigma beats, can just go over 2 to the Sigma options for these Sigma beats, run the attack and see when it succeeds. So uh, it runs faster, per slow by factor of 2 to the uh, Sigma than your fast attack. But if we assume that RSA, you know, it's hard to break RSA without any uh, leakage, then it's also going to be hard to break RSA with some small leakage. Because all you can do is speed up the attack by 2 to the sigma, and if sigma is small, that's not much. And if you really go with, you can lengthen the key. So you can look at the uh, cost of the best algorithm to break RSA, and you say, okay, I'm losing sig to the sigma here, let's make the key a bit longer so that we can uh, 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 support this. And have the following uh, theorem. If P is a linear uh, secret sharing, uh, an integer is in the range 0 to R, and party J receives P of J, then for every possible value of the secret, except the probability 2 to the minus delta, the pro probability of the secret being equal to that value, given the information you have about the share, is at most 1 over R times 2 to the uh, delta over 2 times square root of J. So which the probability was uh, uh, 1 over R, and it's multiplied by these coefficients. But suppose we have 16 servers, and we worried about things that happen with probability greater than 2 to the minus 40, so the test 40. Then the probability now is at most 2 to the 22 over R. So this is, you know, essentially we need 22 bits, which is not good, but maybe not so bad if the, private, if the public key is about 4,000 bits long. Okay. And how do we prove that? So the simple case is where uh, we have a cleaner secret sharing and we have two, uh, okay. Basically, so this is linear secret sharing, we have a polynomial of degree one. This is the free coefficient, this is the other coefficient. And basically, you want to see what's the probability of the secret being A if you know the share of P1. This is the simplest case. Uh, so it's the probability of the free coefficient being A if we know that A plus B, these two coefficients, are equal to P1. So we open up base formula. And then let's see what this. So the probability of one coefficient being equal to a is one over r. This is the range. The probability of the sum being equal to something if the first coefficient is equal to a is also one of the over r. And this thing, the probability of the sum being equal to something is about one over r if this something p of one is close to r. But with high probability, you can show that this value is going to be close to r. So you put the values in and you get something which is almost, these things cancel, almost like one of uh, the original probability. And this is for knowing the share at one, and for knowing other shares it's a bit more complicated. Now, for polynomials of higher degree it's more complicated, so we didn't finish the details. We have a conjecture that for polynomial of degree k, uh, the, the original the bound of probability is 2 to the c, k square over r. This is the original probability, k is the number of servers. So if you have k servers and c is very small, so you lose like, you know, 64 times something bits out of 4,000. I don't know to say if it's good or bad, but it doesn't seem like complete, uh, a complete loss. Okay. Some other ideas, uh, provisioning a new server, suppose you want to get a new server into the system. So you want to give it the share without revealing the polynomial, and now no one knows the polynomial. So the idea is the following. So we have server R, and each server chooses a random polynomial of the same degree as the original polynomial, and this server is zero at R. R is the idea of the new, ser of the new server was joining. And then these servers, send shares of these new polynomials to each other, and when they sum up, they get a random polynomial of the k minus 1, which is random, except that the position r is equal to 0. Okay? And if you sum this to the original polynomial, you get a polynomial which is random, 
extend that position r is equal to the value of the original polynomial, which is the share that the new party should learn. So then the servers just send shares of this you know, new polynomial to the new party, and interpolates them, takes the value at r, and this is the new share that it has. Another problem, which is the chicken and egg problem, is how parties are going to authenticate to the system. So with servers, we're going to store private keys at the servers that you're going to use to authenticate. So this is an SSA server that should run like an SSH connection. It's going to have a private key. With this key, it connects to the system servers that are going to give it shares for authentication in SSH connection. So this is good because uh, the key that it has here, it's only used to authenticate it to our system servers. And then when it wants to connect to other SSH servers, it needs to go online with it. So each SSH connection is going to be uh, uh, authenticated and audited, and it's easy to revoke access for this server. Things are more complicated for authenticated, uh, authenticating human clients. So we assume that adversity might break into less than k of our servers and also might break into the clients. So simple solutions don't work. If the client uses a password to authenticate to the servers, then someone who works to the servers can learn the password. If the client uh, uh, stores a private key on its machine and perhaps secures it with the uh, passphrase, then you can do a dictionary attack on the client. So the tool we use here is TOPRF, which is a threshold OPRF. So it's a uh, recent result from this year of Jareki KIS, Grab Chicken 2. And the idea is that following, and it's a protocol between servers that have shares of a key K and a client that has an input X. At the end of the protocol, the client uh, can compute FK of X, which is a pseudo random function, key by K, which is shared by the servers, on a value X that the client knows, and nothing else is linked. Okay. So the client has an X, it can learn FK of X, and the servers don't know what X is. So what we do, the client has a password, password, and it uses this protocol to learn FK of password from the servers. Okay? So uh, this is a strong uh, 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 secret. If you don't know K, and no one knows K because it's shared, and you don't know the password, you don't, it's, it's completely pseudo random. The only way to try to guess this, to learn this secret, is to go to the servers and try to do a TOPRF protocol with them. But this is an online uh, uh, protocol. So if an attacker tries to impersonate as a client and learn many values of this, T, of this value, it has to do an online attack with the servers, which will be not noticed. Okay? So uh, there's no secret store with the client. Each no, attempt at guessing the password requires an online attack, which is good. And after doing this, the client has a, uh, uh, a strong key with which it can do any strong authentication that, that we want. So this is a really, really strong tool. Okay. And we can add second factor authentication with the key. The client actually installed it on, on a smartphone. Okay, so we implemented everything. Okay. So the library in Java for doing all the fancy crypto stuff was about 4,600 lines of code. This manages the operation of the key servers, 400 codes, each key about 500 codes. The client just about 800 codes because the clients, because they just call this library. Uh, we had to change about 40 lines of code in OpenSSL, which is really, really small and the server was not modified, okay? So all the changes are on the client side and the servers, uh, you don't have to change the servers, you can work with you know, existing servers. And this is a smartphone app for second factor authentication. And we run experiments where uh, some servers were on our network and uh, another server was on AWS. So these are results on the client side so the latency was less than 100 milliseconds. This is the number of, this is the threshold. It goes from 1 up to 12, latency is up to 100 milliseconds, and the throughput is uh, 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 like up to 
down to 20 connections per second for the client, which is good enough. Uh, this is how the uh, uh, latency changed over time, and it's kind of the same. It's good. On the server side, it could support uh, thousands of connections per second. This is the utilization of the uh, uh, CPU and memory as a function of the number of connections per second, but thousands of connections per second looks uh, look pretty good. And if I compare it to other uh, systems uh, in terms of different property software without relying on any HSM, threshold security, fault tolerance, doing care out of N, proactive key refresh, uh, an automated recovery, then we are the only ones who support all of them. And that's it. And just uh, a little bit about previous work. So there's a famous uh, system in this bit community called COCA, uh, which, is, which was doing uh, a distributed certificate, of, uh, a distributed, distributed CA. It was using threshold uh, proactive RSA, but the version which required uh, all servers to uh, be online all the time, or else we uh, expose the distributable servers. Uh, the other solutions for doing uh, uh, threshold crypto with RSA, but none of them supported this proactive version of RSA. That's it. Okay, we have, sorry. we have time for questions. Any questions, comments? It's not that bad. So the client has to have a link. Okay. There are two parameters. One is the threshold, and the other is the number of servers. It's k out of n. So you have k and n. And the client has to do k connections with k servers, and then do k public key operations, but even these are very efficient. I guess the, uh, the more complicated thing is when you want to, do, uh, to add a new server or to do the refresh, then k clients have to do, k servers have to talk with k servers. Uh, but this, I have the numbers in the papers, it's up to 12 to work well. I think that the number of servers, it's more troublesome with this proactive security uh, bounds, that, like the, the leakage is kind of quadratic in the number of servers. I think that's, that's more troublesome. Very quick question there. Uh, yes, so you have to use it. Oh, thank you. Uh, you used inter, sort of this integer secret sharing scheme yes. because the coefficients were random. Do you, it's a nice technique. Do you see more applications of this technique? It's, uh, I'm not sure. Here we had to do it because of the uh, you could work more than three of n. It's in cryptography. It's it's very easy to work when there's no leakage. Then it's very easy to state. I mean, theorems. When there's some leakage, things become messy and we kind of feel uneasy working with them. Although sometimes it might be better. So with integer, so here was a bit uneasy saying like we leak these many bits and it looks okay with RSA. With RSA it seems okay because we have you know, the key is so long. Uh, with other applications it seems you, know, you have to check whether it makes sense. It might be interesting to combine it with privacy amplification. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Okay, so we are now to the paper that won the best student. Paper award. So it's okay. He's going. Um, hi. Uh, hello. Um, so just to chill down a bit. Uh, how many of you know what the music is? Okay. Okay. Got a bunch. So basically, this paper is about how to construct an interactive witness indistinguishable proof of knowledge that does not rely upon any CRS. So like, let's start from scratch. 
basically, a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof is a two-party protocol where there is a prover that would like to show some to prove something to a verifier without necessarily disclosing this something. And um, so formally what we say is that there is a proving algorithm that takes as input a statement, in this case uh, a circuit C, and uh, a witness, in this case a W, that satisfies the circuit, and output some um, cryptographic object, which is a proof pi. On the other side, we have uh, a verification algorithm that takes as input again the statement, which is the circuit C, and this proof, and decides whether the proof was uh, convincing or not. <coughs> And um, so, like, to give you a more pragmatic example, let's imagine that uh, Pinkie Pie uh, wants to, like, solve a Sudoku, and Rainbow Dash would like, um, I don't know, to, like, prove to her that there is a solution to the Sudoku without necessarily spoiling the Sudoku for her. So what they can do, they can sort of engage this cryptographic protocol and uh, guarantee that there is a solution without necessarily disclosing what the solution is. Um, so as you can see, there are some security definitions that we should put in place uh, and they can be sort of condensed in these three. Um, completeness basically means that the protocol is decent. So if everybody is honest, everything goes okay, the proofs are always accepted. Soundness basically protects the verifier. It means that uh, the verifier should not be convinced of a false statement. In the example of a Sudoku, if there is not a solution to the Sudoku, the proof should not accept. And uh, zero knowledge instead protects the prover and basically say that not, says that non, no information about the witness should be leaked except what you can infer from the proof. So in the case of Sudoku, you don't give the solution, you just say that it exists. And um, so this is basically it. There are already some impossibility results that we can mention. For example, we know that in order to achieve zero knowledge, it is necessary to have uh, a CRS uh, something called a, com a common reference string, uh, which is basically a pre-shared uh, entropy, or uh, more in general, is like a public key that is pre-shared by the two parties, and it's assumed to be set up by some trusted third party before any one of the protocol. That is basically it. And um, obviously, we can sort of change and tune a bit these definitions. For example, throughout this talk, we concentrate on uh, a stronger notion of soundness, which is a knowledge soundness. And uh, recall what I mentioned about soundness, it means that uh, I cannot be convinced of a false statement. So what formally we need to prove is that for any adversary that constructs, that outputs um, a statement and a proof, we need to show that there exists a witness, in this case we did it for circuit, so we need to say that there exists a witness so that satisfies the, the circuit. Instead of knowledge soundness, we just don't need to show that it exists, we really need to exhibit it. So we need to construct an extractor that takes the same input of the adversary, but instead of giving me the statement and the proof, really gives me this weakness. And there are some applied cases where this is uh, like super important and, and is necessary for doing the security proof. I did uh, some examples. So like one of these days, I'm, on these days, I'm also doing some stuff related to electronic cache. And one thing, and I found it out, it was important. Specifically, I'm, uh, I was reading about uh, something called confidential transaction. It's something that Maxwell developed in uh, 2013 in this crazy Bitcoin blog, uh, forum post. And uh, this is a bit technical, but like uh, basically there, an electronic coin is a commitment and, uh, and an ISIC. And um, you know, at some point when I prove security, I need to reduce the security to the binding property of the commitment scheme. How do I prove binding? I need to show that there are two openings. How do I show that there is another opening? I need to extract the proof. So I really no, no need to exhibit this witness. Uh, but there is a more classical example that is uh, even more simple to understand, uh, which uh, is anonymous credential. They were introduced by Chom in the 83, and they basically go as follows. Suppose that Rainbow Dash over there uh, would like to enter uh, the, crystal, uh, the Crystal Palace. And in order to enter the Crystal Palace, he needs to prove that he is a U.S. resident and that he is more than 21 years old. Now, it does not necessarily want to leak any more information, but the dumb way of doing this is like show the passport and then you get in. But uh, you know what happens in the Crystal Palace stays in the Crystal Palace, so not necessarily you want to leak all this information. We know how to solve this problem from a cryptographic perspective, and what we do in general is uh, we make Rainbow Dash commit to its anographic information and uh, have this uh, commitment to be signed by some uh, provider. 
And uh, when entering the Crystal Palace, what Rainbow Dash has to do is give the signature along with a proof that attests uh, that some properties are satisfied uh, for the opening of this commitment. So as long as uh, the proof verifies and the signature is made by a public key that is trusted by this, organic, by, by this uh, Crystal Palace, uh, everything is okay, not everything. Um, Everybody's fine, and uh, because of the zero knowledge property, no further information is leaked. However, as I mentioned before, you should uh, imagine that there is like some CRS there in the middle that is set up before, because we have this impossibility result. So both parties at some point need to trust this uh, third party that produces uh, uh, this uh, shared entropy. Um, so a legitimate question at this point is what if the CRS was maliciously generated? And this is something that uh, Bellare and others asked themselves in 2016. And um, except that they don't say maliciously generated, they use a fancy term, which is subversion. And, um, and so what they found out is that uh, actually you can do some, uh, some pretty bad things. And um, so for example, you can see the paper of Schwabauer in uh, uh, in 2018 at PKC, where uh, it basically shows that even protocols that are currently used, like Pinocchio for, uh, for snarks, uh, if uh, the CRS is done maliciously, you don't have any guarantees about some of this. Um, so what they do, they, put, they sort of put in place this definition for uh, subversion, soundness, subversion zero knowledge, and in this definition are very similar to the ones of before, except that uh, in addition to the statement and the proof, you all, the adversary gets also to generate the CRS. This is sort of an intuition of how this, uh, this thing is formally done. And, um, and also there is another negative result that comes out of this paper, and it is this basically if you want this strong notion of soundness with the, sub, uh, the subversion of a variant, you cannot hope to have zero knowledge. And this is kind of a downer, but uh, on the happier side, uh, there are perhaps some relaxations of zero knowledge that we can use. Most notably, there is this thing called uh, witness indistinguishability that, uh, that perhaps uh, is, uh, can be used in this case. Witness indistinguishability means basically that if I give you two proofs uh, under two different witnesses, you cannot tell which witness will use for which proofs. And uh, so, for example, in the case of before, of anonymous credential, you cannot tell if the age was like 22 years old or 40 years old. Does it make sense? No. Uh, but for example, if I were to use the Sudoku thing of before, well, there is only one solution, so this sort of two different witness thing is always satisfied, but the security notion does not really make any sense for us. So like, you should be aware that uh, this is weaker than zero knowledge, but with some uh, caveats. Um, and anyway, this notion is totally orthogonal to, to soundness, so as long as the proof verifies, Pinkie Pie is super happy and everybody is good. Um, so, so far, what you should, uh, like, wrapping up what I said so far, um, unless you want to trust uh, somebody, a third party, having a CRS is bad, and uh, if you want some strong notion of soundness, well, then you cannot really have zero knowledge. Perhaps you can have witness indistinguishability, and this is what we try to focus on. Um, we've been looking into this thing called uh, non-interactive ZAPs. They were introduced by Groth, Ostrowski, and Sahai in 2006. And uh, the name is preternomatopeic. It, like, uh, it goes in a ZAP. Uh, basically, the prover can deliver one single message to the verifier, and that's the whole proof. There is no CRS, no trusted setup at the beginning, no nothing. And uh, as I said at the beginning, they cannot really be zero knowledge, but they are witness distinction. Also, the construction is quite nice. It's, uh, it basically follows some sort of setup that is similar to an ISIC, but um, there are two possible CRS that they show that you can use. One that is perfectly witness and one that leads to a proof that is perfectly witness and distinguishable, and another one that leads to a proof that is perfectly sound. Now, from here, you will like uh, the prover. You have only one message that the prover needs to send, so you will like the prover to choose the CRS. However, you cannot really make the prover choose the CR simply just choose the CRS because uh, the prover could always take the CRS that is perfectly distinguishable, and so you don't have any guarantees about soundness. So the cute thing about this paper is that they sort of remark that uh, perfectly indistinguishable proofs 
are kind of uh, very rare. There is like one in the wall space, and uh, this is sort of a bit of a hand-waved uh, proof, but uh, they sort of notice that if you, for example, take a CRS and then the next one, well, at least one of the two is necessarily perfectly sound. So from here, it's pretty straightforward what to do. You sort of uh, make the prover do two proofs, one under a CRS that is chosen, and another one that is uh, deterministically generated from the first one. And then you verify both proofs. Why is this secure? Well, it, it, it is sound because, we, as I said, at least one of the two CRS is perfectly sound, so as long as I verify both proofs, we are good. Why is it perfectly witness indistinguishable? Because, uh, as I said, maybe I did not, but the two CRSs, the two possible setups, are indistinguishable through a computational argument. So I can move from one CRS to the other uh, with a negligible advantage, and uh, I can always move to the one that is witness indistinguishable and then flop the witness. So this is sort of, uh, if you're familiar with hybrid arguments, this is sort of the way it works out. Anyways, the, the thing to, to keep with you over here is that you basically with the two things that are very similar to music, but they are proven to be witness indistinguishable, I can, uh, I can sort of have just one message without any CRS officially uh, done before the protocol. The CRS is chosen by the prover itself. Um, so from here we've proven, uh, they've proven just soundness. As I mentioned at the beginning, we wanted to have knowledge soundness, the stronger notion of soundness, because they're applied scenarios where we want this. So what we tried to do was uh, take the exams and move them to knowledge soundness. Why is this important in theory? Because we do not know how to create witness indistinguishable proof of knowledge without a CRS. Why is this useful in practice? Because for example we can do, I don't know, anonymous credentials with no trust etc. Um, so since we're proving knowledge soundness, we need a knowledge assumption. And our, the assumption was already used by Bellare and others in the, in the subversion paper in 2016. And it basically says that if, you, if I give you a DFL non triple, then you really need, I really must have known at least one of the two DLLs. So, how do we formalize this? We say that for any adversary that takes as input a symmetric bilinear uh, group description and uh, some random coins and give me, give me three group elements which I can verify they are DFL on triple because I, ha it's, uh, I have the pairing map and they are symmetric. There exists an extractor that takes the same input of the adversary and gives me the D log of one two, of the two group elements. The intuition behind this is that if you, if you give me three group elements that satisfy that, that are like a DFL on triple, well, if you pick uniformly a random X, then to generate Z, you really need to know the D log of Y. And vice versa, if you pick uniformly around random Y in order to generate Z, then you really know, you need to know the D log of X. That's sort of the intuition behind it. And uh, how did we make uh, the ZAP with this assumption of like sound? Uh, the growth of structures uh, high ZAPs? Well, uh, remember what I said about the ZAP, that they are basically something very similar to true music, where uh, the second proof is one CRS is derived from the first CRS. And um, so, also, the one thing that I should mention is that the CRS, very hand-waved as, as an intuition, is, a, is like a public key. So, our idea was that you could, uh, we could make uh, the prover, again, make two different apps uh, independent, uh, one of the other, and then make the prover also give some, uh, something that we call a linking element, uh, which is like the DFLM of the two uh, CRSs. So under this knowledge assumption, we can sort of extract the secret key and sort of uh, decrypt the weakness from the proof. Why is this secure? Again, this is always the question. It's uh, knowledge sound because from here I can extract the secret key for one of the two zaps, and I know from the previous uh, proof that at least one of the two is, uh, is sound. So I have a hope that at least one of the two contains the real weakness, and so I can extract it. Why is it witness indistinguishable? Because each zap independently is so, so I can sort of uh, go through that. I just need to make an argument about this uh, linking element, but uh, like we did the proof and it sort of works out. You just have to change or something. So. And uh, so it all goes good. And, um, and this was uh, like the first result that we did. Um, after that, we sort of realized that it was not like super efficient. It's like for music plus uh, uh, these, uh, that go over symmetric pairings, so we try to make this um, a bit more efficient. 
and we've been looking at this um, Grotza Heights apps that were developed by Ruffles in 2015, and um, they go over asymmetric pairings, and they are better than uh, Grotzowski Heights apps by a constant factor, and uh, and also the idea is pretty much the same. So you have uh, these uh, two possible setups, and you force the prover to decide the CRS and derive the second in such a way that at least one of the two is perfectly sound. And um, so since it was an asymmetric pairing, we had sort of to change a bit our assumption to fit it into this asymmetric group description. And please note that in this case, so you, it's not as easy to verify that it's a BTL not triple. Uh, but once we did this, the proving it was pretty straightforward and it didn't require any change to the protocol. So this was a, a pretty good thing we were happy about. And um, so to wrap it all up, what we sort of understood with this was that we could create proofs of knowledge that were witness indistinguishable and without any CRS. Again, from a theoretical perspective, this is useful because we didn't know that they existed. From a practical perspective, they should be useful because, for example, you can do like anonymous credentials. And uh, if you ever wanted to like uh, do this stuff in practice, you should know that if you use Kotasovsky Sahai zaps of knowledge, then you should like uh, estimate double the size of a zap. Then if you do like broad high proofs uh, and, uh, in the ZAP version, then you can just keep the same size without any change to the protocol. That's about it.